so it was wonderful. You know, I was worried. It, well, not worried. I was curious if I would feel anxious or have anxiety about coming on these tours. So I actually felt very relaxed and calm going into them, and I don't quite know why, but it feels great. Um, before I start, though, I do want to point out that there are some very special people in the audience here tonight, uh, to me personally and professionally. So both Jeff Ventry and Carol Ray, who also starred in Blackfish and are huge advocates, are here. And uh, the amount of awareness that these guys have put out there is just amazing. And they've been role models to me. I've learned a thing or two from them in the last two and a half years. And also, Howard Garrett is also in the crowd. And, uh, so after I get through um, what I would like to say to you tonight and get through the Q&A, I'm going to invite those guys up on stage because I think you really want to see them and hear what they have to say just in general. So let's get started. So, um, you know, how did I go from, you know, being this little boy that had this dream and wanted this life with killer whales and achieving that dream and being happy at SeaWorld for so many years and being a SeaWorld loyalist and believing everything that they said and offended them to now standing here tonight and being in front of you. And a lot of things happened and it was a gradual process. And, um, and you know, when I look back on it now, it's kind of scary to see how it all unfolded because it's a uh, very cult-like mentality. And uh, Carol said to me once, and it's actually in the book, um, because one night we were having a, one of our famous uh, behavioral discussions, like killer whale trainers like to do, and we were having a, a disagreement, which is totally normal. We have different views on things at times and approaches with the whales. And she said to me, she said, um, you know, sometimes when you're away from it longer, you get a greater perspective. And it just really stopped me in my tracks because it really resonated with me. And the last two and a half years, I've thought about that countless times because it's proven to be so true, so incredibly true. So, um, so for me, I'll just briefly, don't worry, I won't give you like that. Once upon a time, I'm six. <laughs> but once upon a time, I was six. <laughs> My parents took me to SeaWorld, Florida in 1980. And here I am this child, and I am in Shandu Stadium, and it's 5,000 people, and the lights are going, and the music is going. And I was already, of course, an animal lover, because it's either in you or it's not. And um, to see these animals I had never seen before is incredible. Incredible killer whales. Like despite what living conditions they're in, um, and this is where I think it confuses so many people. It's the animal that is so magnificent. It's the it's the animal that is so impressive. So when you walk away and you go, "Wow, that was amazing," it's not because they were in that concrete little tank that they shouldn't have been in. It's because they are impressive, and so it really psychologically does that number on you. But especially as a child. I was just so seduced by that atmosphere, seeing this little bitty trainer and this magnificent animal I had never seen before, having this relationship and all of the, the uh, technical end of it and all of the people. And from that day forward, it formed my identity. And um, you know, growing up in the 70s and 80s, I didn't think about captivity in Southeast Texas too. That may have played a role, I don't know. But the 70s, let's just say it's for safety reasons, 70s and 80s. Um, you know, I didn't think of anything about it. I just thought it was uh, normal. And um, even when I started my career at Seward of Texas in 1993 at age 20, I still thought it was fine. I didn't think anything about it. And even seeing the collapsed dorsal fins, even seeing the teeth that were so badly damaged, at that stage in your career, you don't know anything. It takes you years before you learn about killer whales, and certainly before you're interacting with killer whales, swimming with killer whales, all that. So I didn't know. I thought, well, I guess the dorsals are like that in the wild. And of course, SeaWorld's teaching us that too. You know, the, the line that we were taught to say to the public was 
23% of all photographed killer whales in the wild have a collapsed dorsal. Well, we all know that that's untrue. You hear Jeff say that in blackfish, less than 1%. And Dr. Ingrid Visser has even repeatedly sent letters, official letters to SeaWorld to tell them to stop misquoting her research. They still continue to use her research and, 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 and distort it. So to try to make people think this is something that's normal when we know that it's not. So, and that's SeaWorld's game, as we know. They're master manipulators. And they'll give a uh, half-truth. Sometimes it's not a truth at all. Uh, but that half-truth, they can glamorize it. They had the, the power and money for so many years to make the perfect commercials and seduce people right in. And look how happy these whales are. And look at how much we love them and how much of a family we all are. And it's all a facade. It's all a facade. And when I began my career, the first, before I even noticed, because you know, I was such a low level work trainer in the beginning, and it was before I was doing everything with the animals and certainly with the killer whales, the first sign that not all was right in Oz was how they treated the trainers. Here, I thought I was coming into this environment, you know, as a boy growing up, that we were all going to live happily ever after and all love each other and support each other and, uh, Live, this, live, live these magical lives with these whales, and you get into it, and it's immediately a cutthroat environment. It's immediately a fear-induced environment of you better do what we tell you to do, or we're going to take this all away from you. Everything that you've wanted, your whole childhood, your whole dream, is going to be gone just like that if you challenge us. So, you know, you shut up. You, it shuts you up because you don't want to lose your childhood and you want to be with those animals. So, you know, there, there were some trainers and their stories are in this book and I won't get into it, but you'll read it. But um, there were some distinct role models of mine that were star trainers. So as I was a lower level rank trainer and they were the trainer, rank trainer that I wanted to become one day, I thought these people were untouchable because they were true stars at Shamu Stadium, just fantastic with the whales and fantastic in the water and behaviorally and just showmen. And I thought these guys were untouchable until they challenged management on something or spoke up and said, I don't agree with that. That's not right. This is not right for this animal. And I saw how quickly they fell from grace and they were defamed, they were ridiculed, they were blacklisted. Um, Trainers, so many trainers that nearly died from fatalities, from injuries from whales that, that sued SeaWorld for negligence. SeaWorld ended up forcing them into settlements and gag orders because that's what they wanted. You know, more than the settlement was the gag order that you can never speak about these incidents. And um, even a, a great example of that is in the movie uh, Blackfish, that scene where Tamari Tolleson, she's she gets pulled in by a orchid, but you see two whales dragging her under the orchid and splash and splash is actually the whale that actually crunched her arm. And yes, Camry made mistakes, um, but the point of, of that story is that that video, however SeaWorld, and I don't know, we, of course we had our own rumors with all of us, but um, um, you know, obviously they were very persuasive with the Public who had who shot that video because they got the only copy of it from the, from the, the patrons that visited the park. So they got that copy of that video and it was under lock and key at Shamu Stadium. And only us at Shamu Stadium trainers ever saw that video until Don was killed. It was submitted, well, not submitted. It was confiscated as evidence and it was submitted as evidence as trial. And then under the Freedom of Information Act, it was released. This is just one example of a million that I could give you of how non-transparent this company is. This is how much they have to hide that you know these things are not revealed to the public. And of course, we have to abide by that. We can't speak about those incidents to the public, you know, or you lose your job, you don't get your promotion. They move you away from the animals that you're working with, whether it's killer whales that you have the relationships with and you love. Maybe you're at sea lion and you're happy there and you love those animals. They take you away from there. There's always this way, this way to get you, and it's very obvious. And we all know it, and they 
all knew it. So they had us. Because it was our passion, it was our dream. We, we loved those animals. We were there for the right reasons. But as time went on, it was just undeniable the horrific effects of captivity on these animals. Once you realize, wait, that's not normal that their dorsal fins are collapsed. It's not normal that their teeth are so badly ground down and broken off from out of boredom biting the stage and biting the ledges of the pool that they would develop in holes in their teeth and then they would get abscesses. And we would have to go in and manually drill the tooth in what is known as a pulpotomy. And once it would erupt, then we would have to every day for the rest of their life invasively irrigate their teeth with a metal catheter in and out of the hole repeatedly with a hydrogen peroxide solution. This is their world-class veterinary care, which I'd like to poke a hole in right now since we're on this. Forgive me if I go off on these tangents, but I have time, so I'll go and kill it while we can. <laughs> when they get on and they say, we have world-class veterinary care, you do. But that world-class veterinary care is to treat what's happened to these animals because of captivity. That's what you're treating. It's not because they need this world-class veterinary care out in the wild. It's because these animals are suffering from chronic stress that causes ulcers. They have to be on medications every single day. Jeff and Carol and I were talking about that the other day, and Sam Berg, who's not here tonight, but tagamin. We use tagamin on most of the whales every single day. Um, Splash, Una, they were on medications that I can remember every single day they were on medications for their entire life. Um, Una had, we couldn't get a, we, we did not know how to identify it. She had these fungal spores in her urine, which represented a urinary, uh, not a urinary, uh, um, uh, help me out here. Um, I'm looking for something tracked and not urinary tract. But infection, there was infection in there that we could not identify. So she was on this medication um, to treat that for her, her entire life, every single day. And we didn't know what caused it. We didn't know uh, where it was coming from. We just knew that we couldn't get rid of it. Um, Je John Jet Jeff Fentry uh, pointed out, um, they put in a paper, it's in the book, um, how two of our whales in our collection have died from mosquito-transmitted encephalitis. This is something that does not happen naturally to whales in the wild. So what, what SeaWorld wants you to believe is that they live in these pristine environments. And that's the reason why they can never go to a sea sanctuary. They can never be reintroduced back into the wild because the wild is dangerous. The wild causes is where all the pollution is. And the wild is the reason why they're in danger. The southern resident population is endangered is because they decimated the population right here in your waters in the 60s and 70s and nearly wiped out that population. And now they have the audacity to try to say that that's why they need to keep having them in captivity so that they can save them. That's disgusting. I mean, it's like fingernails on a chalkboard when I hear them say that. Suited for captivity. 
they're not thriving, they're not surviving. And you know, we started in our Blackfish promotion, we were using the word, you know, that they, they're not thriving. The Seabro tried to take that away from us, now they try to use it in their PR <laughs> jump. I'll say it like that, because that's really what it is. Like, oh, our animals are thriving. Well, not really, when you look at the death rates and you look at the ages that those animals have died and what they're dying from, I certainly would not say that your animals are thriving. All the medical, the host of medical conditions that we have to treat those whales with, some that are on medications every single day of their life. Now that now you're oh, another the other one I love is our successful breeding program. Let's analyze that for a second. So Taku bred his mother. So direct inbreeding that produced a calf and a lion. That doesn't happen in the wild. So keto inbred Kohana. Keto is her uncle. So that's also considered direct inbreeding. He inbred her twice. And that, again, would not have happened in the wild. And um, let's look at also why maybe that was even allowed to happen in that social structure. So they took Ohana at only three years old, away from her mother, Takara, sent her to Spain. She was the oldest female at age three. So she had no mother anymore at age three and not, not even another adult female of her own age or even older to help her out. And then her uncle, Keo, inbreeds her twice. She rejects, she, I'm gonna push this over, I'm um, <laughs> She rejects both her calves, no surprise, because she doesn't know. What happens with people when that happens? When someone has, like when a child, an 11 year old, 12 year old has a child and you see that the baby's been discarded in the waste basket in the, the bathroom in school. Well, why would we think that this calf would have the, the, uh, the knowledge to, take, to know what to do? So she rejected both calves and the second calf died within its first year of life. This is not a successful breeding program. This is an abomination. That's what that is. There's no other way. How can they even with a straight face call a, 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 a breeding program that has inbreeding, now crossbreeding between different whales that wouldn't even interact in the wild, that, have, that has created hybrid whales with no true social identity. So it's basically a genetic mutant that doesn't even exist in the wild. And then you have cats that are rejecting their own calves and they're dying. How is this exactly a successful breeding program? I don't really get it. But they'll continue to say it in their speeches. And any time that they're cornered with anything, they go straight, they're carefully crafted, carefully worded talking points. If you say something about Kohana, they'll go, well, we say manatees and sea turtles. That's fantastic. <laughs> I'm just so happy that you say manatees and sea turtles. I actually think that's great. <laughs> We're talking about killer whales in captivity and should they be in captivity? And we all know in this room the answer is no. There is an overwhelming amount of science now that makes it beyond a reasonable doubt. We know that these animals are dying and they are suffering before they are dying. All in the name of entertainment and all in the name of profit. So, I'll give you... This is what my publisher wanted me to do this. So give you, give you, give you like a, a good story, a good, a good feel good story, and uh, one of the highlights of the book, and then give you uh, a bad, a dark one. And I'll be giving you some of the, you know, the realities of SeaWorld, but of course, probably know what I'm gonna talk about when I, I'm gonna talk about Don's death as the, the dark, one of the darkest, days, but I'm going to start with the, the feel good one. So um, it didn't start off feeling good because I had broken my ribs on car in a show. It wasn't her fault. It was an impression. My foot slipped off of her rostrum on a stand on spy hot. And um, she was going, we already pulled up on the bottom of the pool. We're about to break the surface. So she's going full speed so she can get her full length of her body above the surface of the water with me standing on her. And I felt my foot slipping off, and I was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to hang on just by my toe tips, but I just couldn't. And my foot washed off her. You can tell in the video she's trying to stop, but 
she can't because we're breaking the surface. So she's 5,000 pounds, she's got the hardest rostrum of any whale that I've ever worked with. It's like a rock, so it's like bad luck. And uh, it just hit me right in the ribs and it broke um, ribs and soft tissue in the front and in the back. So it just like compressed my rib cage. So as it knocked the breath out of me and you know, it sent me like a rag doll, of course, um, Takara is sharp, what we call sharking around you. Um, so she's at the surface of the water and she's going completely around me in a circle and her dorsal fin is perfectly above the surface. Well, the entire time she's doing that, she's echolocating on me and she's also vocalizing vocalizations that are consistent when an animal is concerned, like showing how concerned about their environment, their social structure. Of course, as trainers, we, we learn to recognize all various types of vocalizations and what they mean. We don't know exactly what they're saying, but we know what moods and everything that they represent. So as she's doing this, you know, for those of you who don't know their echolocation, they can, it's like basically a sonogram, being ultra, having an ultrasound. They can see inside you. Um, they can, if a woman, a, a trainer is pregnant, they can hear the second heartbeat. They can echolocate and see the fetus. I mean, very science fiction type stuff. So she can see inside me and see if something's broken or not. So she's continuing to go around me, echolocating. You can hear it, you can feel it in your chest. It's such a bizarre um, sensation because even if they're far away, it feels like they're right here. It's just very odd. Um, so ultimately, she she came over to me, still making the concerned vocalizations after both of my hands on her rostrum. And Takara normally is a very rough ride. She's a very explosive animal, and uh, it's one of the things I loved about her because she was just just dynamite. She always she was like, look, this is the way it's going to be. We're going to go fast, and you're either going to make it or you're not. But I'm not making any changes. And I love that about her because that was her personality. And she would get into it. Like, she would challenge you. Like, OK, yeah, you think you're ready? Let's go a little faster. How about this? I mean, was, there was one crash scene that I have that's saved on blue footage. Because she was racing another whale. I said, hey, you're, you're forgetting you have a trainer on you. <laughs> you're racing this other whale. So she threw me, to beat Una at that stage, she threw me so fast that I slid further than we had ever seen, uh, slid before. So it forced me to have to jump up to a second level, which no one had ever done before. And of course, I just bit it and crashed and slid into the set. It was actually great. You know, those types of crashes are fun when you don't get hurt. But, um, but anyway, so back to her personality. So she is, she's rough. She's a rough ride, and only a few of us that swam with her, four of us that swam with her, because she was considered restricted. And, um, but here, knowing, I mean, obviously we know the intelligence of this, well, we, we have a glimmer into how intelligent these, these animals are. We, you know, we've yet to learn everything. Um, we have no idea what they're truly capable of. Um, could one day just absolutely amaze us even more than it does today. And um, she came to me very gently, didn't even cause, like, um, as her body shifted in front of me, no wake or anything like that that would make my body move or anything. I put both my hands on her rostrum. She stopped making the concerned vocalizations, and I asked her for a peck push. So, um, you know, it's like we're, I put both of my feet out, and then she puts both of her, each one of her pecs on my feet and then I'll, I can steer her wherever, which way I'm gonna go. And normally, um, she'll hit you hard. Those pecs will hit your feet hard. One time she even knocked my back out of alignment because she hit my feet so hard. But in this situation, I never even felt her pecs touch my feet. Not at all. And I was in that, at that point, I was, everything was really starting to tighten up. I was starting to get in worse and worse shape. And I knew I couldn't make it out of the pool without her. I needed her to take me out of the pool. But she, I never felt her, her pecs touch my feet. So I'm effortlessly, you know, gliding into the back pool. She takes me to the back pool again when we do a pec step off, which of course Jeff and Carol were familiar with. You know, the whales tend to just like kind of like toss you, throw you out of the pool, and you, it's, it, you know, it's everything on your body is just very jarring. There's nothing gentle about swimming with those size animals. And um, but in this situation. She sank down really deep. At this point, when you, 
because you have to turn around to get off. Now you're just one foot is on one peg and the other one is just off to the side. She sank down really deep and then she came up really slow and really high past her pectoral flippers. So all I had to do was take just the smallest step like that to step out of the pool instead of being thrown out of the pool. Now what's amazing about that is that this is something that was not taught to her. We didn't teach her this. This was not part of her criteria. This is not what she knew, what she needed to do to be reinforced. This was a choice that she made based on the situation, which shows the intelligence of the whale, it shows the relationship, and it shows the awareness. So that's the good story. Now, unfortunately, I gotta get to the bad one. So I tried to mark this because there's a couple of points, so hopefully I won't repeat myself, but um, all right, so when, when you know, Alexis had been killed on Christmas Eve, just two months before dawn, and um, we were back in the water with the whales, swimming in shows, including myself, um, within two days. We didn't have any details yet of what had happened to Alexis. It would take about two and a half, three weeks to find out before we got the full account analysis and video. And even then, I directly asked Mike Scarpuzzi, when he gave the account analysis, Mike Scarpuzzi is the VP of Zoological in California, um, I asked him if Keto had crushed Alexis, and he broke eye contact with me, which anyone who knows Mike, he doesn't really do that. <laughs> and um, he said, we don't know what happened. He most likely panicked and drowned when Keto grabbed his leg and pulled him under, period. That became the standard go-to company line from then on. However, what Sewell didn't know is that I was already in contact with my colleagues in Spain, and I knew that when they pulled Alexis's lifeless body from the bottom of the pool, that he had so much blood coming from his nose, his ear, his nose, his mouth, and they believed his ears, because it was just everywhere, all over his face, and then all over the stage, and as Brian Rokish, the Seawold supervisor who was there at the time, was frantically trying to revive him, blood was all over Brian Rokish's face. The important point of that is, is that that was never, ever communicated to any of us at Shamu Stadium, ever. Clearly, this reflected that he had massive internal injuries, and the autopsy report also reflected that um, in, in graphic detail. Management never even went over the autopsy report with us. So they left it, even to the day I resigned in August of 2012, that he most likely panicked and drowned when Keto pulled him under. So, anyway, so that's disgusting. Um, so about Dawn, so when Dawn died, they shut up quick. There was absolutely no discussion, but I mean, obviously there was discussion about, you know, obviously this, is ha this had happened, but what happened how they tried to rescue her, what worked, what didn't. Um, all that became a no-no topic, you don't bring up. And I remember one time, uh, Chuck Tompkins, who's the corporate VP of animal training, he came to Texas and I had a very good relationship with Chuck and I pressed him because I wanted to see the video, even though I had known Don for nine years and I knew it would be hard to watch, from a behavioral standpoint, I wanted to know if there was a place where she was trying to work him through it and maybe see where if something was working and she was making progress, but then she lost him again. So just from a behavioral standpoint, I was fascinated by trying to see if she even had that ability to try to work him through it. And Chuck shut me down pretty hardcore and pretty quick. He just said, John, very aggressively, he said, there is nothing there. So I knew my place with Chuck and I didn't push it any further. Um, but I would get more of it so if you're not, not reading from, from the book, which would be able to tell, so I'm sorry about breaking personal contact, but this is, this is important for me to read it the way that it is. I get more of the inside story after I visited the Florida facility in December 2011. Every year, each park in the SeaWorld system tries to send one trainer to one of the other facilities. It wasn't really to learn from each other, as is evident from the way Lindsay and I argued over behavior protocols in our team. 
San Diego, San Antonio, and Orlando were all very much set in their ways. But it was a chance to get to see what a difference, what those differences were, and a chance to network. I get into a wetsuit, be on stage and poolside, watching how the trainers interacted with the whales during sessions and shows. And being in an Orlando also gave me a chance to see how the park was dealing with telephone in the aftermath of Don's death. As a member of the Big Sea World family, I've met some of the Florida trainers before. In fact, I've known some of them for years. Of course, I've known Don, like I said, for nine years. As the week of my visit went by, I would hear about what happened on that day as they tried to rescue Don, and these were people who were directly part of the rescue effort. They were act actively pulling the net um, to force Philip from into various pools. So these were first-hand rescuers. Um, okay, I'm probably going to say how we stood. Um, I missed one go. As the week of my, for, as my visit, so I was there for a full week. As the week of my visit went by, I would hear about what happened on that day as I tried to rescue John. The one story that moved me the most involved a highly experienced trainer named, La, named Lars Servick. And it reflects what I believe about trainers and whales having a bond that not even a tragedy can break. <coughs> Laura is probably the most experienced and knowledgeable worker trainer in SeaWorld, with 24 years of experience at Shamu Stadium. She had worked with Telecom when he arrived in Florida in January 1992 and knew him better than anyone else. But as a result of her promotion to become the second highest ranking animal curator in Orlando, Laura had been reassigned to Dolphin Stadium, which is kind of a side story to that, but that's out of the book. Um, at the end of 2009, so just a couple of months before Alexis and Don were killed, they had moved uh, Laura Servick and also another very experienced trainer, Liz Morris, out of Shamu and moved them to Dolphin Stadium. Um, and again, there's a, an interesting backstory to that. Um, Laura and Don were best friends. They wore rings to signify the strength of that friendship. But February 24, 2010 would bring two of the most important beings in Laura's life in fatal conflict. It was like having a good friend kill an even better friend. Laura was at work on her side of the Marine Park at Dolphin Stadium. She was on the phone with Kelly Flaherty Clark, the animal training curator at Orlando. So this is the person that basically took Laura's job and then Laura got shipped off the Dolphin. Hint, hint. So when Kelly said she had just been told by Dan Brown, Park's president that the emergency alarm had just gone off at Shamu Stadium. Laura looked at her husband, Mike, a supervisor at Sea Lion Stadium, and said, I've got to go now. She drove to Shamu across the compound, and it was chaos when she got there. Who is it? She shouted out to the crowd that had gathered. Telephone and Don came in response. He has Don. Laura ran to the platform at the Diamond Shamu pool. Telephone had Don in his mouth. Laura recalled that Don's hair was missing. She saw that the trainers were deploying the net to try to force Telecom from one pool into another so that they could finally get into a med pool with a lifting floor. Her heart was racing. She didn't know whether Don was dead or alive. The trainers were able to move Telecom into a med pool, but it was one without the lifting floor. And so they had to move him on through the linked pools. He ultimately had to go through three pools until they got him into the pool that actually had the lifting floor where they could beat him. As she later told a detective of the Orlando Sheriff's Office in a taped conversation that has been made public, quote, my first thought was I was very mad that we didn't have that lift station because of this animal. We know he's killed two other people, end quote. At that point, she still didn't know if Don was dead. She was still in Telecom's jaws, and Laura began to pray about what to do next. Laura saw a Shamu supervisor, Jenny Mayro, being comforted by her husband. She walked over to hug Jenny, who said, She's gone, Laura. She's gone. At that point, Laura turned and thought for a moment, and another trainer then ran up to her and said, It seems as though we're exacerbating it. And Laura agreed, Yes, you're right. Let's just calm down. I will get to Kelly. She asked Kelly Flaherty Clark, Sea World Curator, if she could tell everyone to just back off. She's already gone, and we don't want him to mangle her body. She wanted to preserve the dignity of the friend she loved. After Clark ordered the rescuers off, Telecom appeared to relax a bit. 
Laura then went into the locker room. She removed her street clothes and put on a shampoo wetsuit. Quote, I had made the decision, she later told the detective of the Orlando Sheriff's Office in the taped conversation, I'm getting that body. I'm getting my friend. Her advantage was her years-long relationship with Tillicum. He knows me, she told the detective. The Oracle was finally at a pool with a lift station, and Laura waited for the floor to lift him up, essentially beaching him. She stepped up to the platform and made eye contact with the whale who had her friend in his mouth, shaking the body back and forth. And I want to add right there that the people that, um, multiple people that were part of the rescue effort said that he was shaking her with such force that parts of her body were coming off. She looked at Tillicum again, right to his eyes, and said in a strong voice, and I want you to understand the situation. This is a point where the most horrific thing is happening and people are viewing him as a total monster. And Laura, though, still had the strength to do this. She stepped over that wall and she looked him right in the eye and said, it's all right, baby, settle down. She knelt and cradled Don's torso while Tilcom still had her in his jaws. It's all right, let go, she told him, let go. Tilcom seemed to be responding. The rescuers were once again trying to get a net over Tilcom's head. They had already draped one over his body. She said, he almost let her go, just tuck it around his garage. They did, and she was able to extricate her friend. She now focused all her attention on Dawn, looking at her face and bringing the body to a place where no one could guard as they cut the wetsuit away and tried in vain to use the defibrillator. Okay, help me with that. I always screw that word. <laughs> defibrillator. <laughs> Spell it out. To bring her back. The rescuers realized that Dawn's left arm had been torn off but managed to reopen Telecom's mouth to retrieve it. This is where some controversy comes in, where they're like, oh, well, in the movie, he says he swallowed it, whatever. As Carol and Jeff can certainly testify to, the whales will swallow things and regurgitate them back up, and, and, they're, and they're still whole and still intact. They do it with their fish all the time. So he could have very well completely have swallowed the arm and then regurgitated it back up. Or it could have been just ripped off and then has they got her body out, it was still in the back of his throat. That part is unclear. These people who told me this were the rescuers that were behind his body, so they couldn't see at the, the, the head. So it's a little unclear, but it doesn't matter if the arm was ripped off at the shoulder. Totally, completely severed. Um, okay, so the rescuers, the rescuers realized that Don's left arm had been torn off, managed to reopen so it was not to retrieve it. Don's sister ring, identical to the one she shared with Laura, was on the hand of that arm that he tore off. After calling Don's husband, Scott, with the news, Laura tried to help Kelly Flaherty Clark move Tillicum from the med pool to isolate him in a back pool once the mechanical lift was lowered. Still in her wetsuit, Laura took a bucket of fish and tried to convince the orca to move into another pool. He appeared to be responding to some of her signals. Good boy, okay, you ready? As much she's trying to motivate him. She's trying to like ask for simple behaviors, get a simple behavior correct, and then she's trying to build on that to get him like, yes, that's right, that's what we want. Now let's go, let's move into the other pool. So that's what's happening here. And it looked like he was he was she was going to get, get him out of the pool. But ultimately he refused to leave the med pool. Laura said it was because he could see that Dawn was still nearby, her body covered in a black blanket only a few feet away from the telephone on the other side of the wall. He knew she was there, she told the detective on tape. That was his possession. Don't try to take that away. And I just want to go back to page 190 and 191 for this last detail on there. So during this aggression, and, in, and the reason why I want to point this out is because even during the OSHA hearings, SeaWorld's expert um, um, witness that I worked with, Jeff Andrews, I worked with him at SeaWorld California, he testified under oath that Telecom was, quote, never aggressive with Dawn during the incident, but was rather just trying to keep her from surfacing. That was his, that was his testimony. How outrageous when she's dismembered. So Telecom had, during this aggression, Telecom struck Don several times with his head, seizing her in his mouth as he dragged her under, swimming around beneath the surface with her in his jaws. 
He had her at various moments by her arm, by the neck and shoulder area, by her hair, and by her leg. By the end of all this, she had been scalped, so her scalp was completely detached from her skull with the full head of hair on the bottom of the pool. Her spinal cord was severed, her ribs were broken, her left arm had been torn off, and all her remaining limbs were dislocated. This entire event also Tillichum exhibited highly aggressive vocalizations, and he never once came under control and even attempted multiple, countless times to emergency recall him. So we internally never discussed this other than what it was, which was a highly aggressive event. To this very day, Siegel still says Tillichum did not attack Dawn. It's disgusting. This is I don't I don't even know how this company has gotten this far with when when things are so glaringly obvious. So that's um, what I wanted to read. Was required to read. Um, so so where are we now? So with you know when I kind of before I go into the Q and A, where are we now since Blackfish? So one of the fun, this is really funny. Right after Blackfish came out. Um, we may have still been in Sundance, I think, at that point, and I was speaking to a colleague of mine, and, and they were uh, speaking to Chuck Tompkins, uh, who, again, who's the VP of the Animal Training, so he controls all three parks, and they asked him, so what is the game plan now? And he goes, well, what do you mean our game plan? And they said, well, what are you going to do now that Blackfish is coming out? And he goes, well, we don't have to do anything. Like, who's really going to see it? <laughs> well, the answer is, and this is, According to all the numbers that have been tallied up by all the professional people that would know, that the conservative estimate is over 150 million people. <laughs> so, a little cocky, a little too soon there for that time. <laughs> um, which is, that's just SeaWorld. We gotta know them. They've always been that way. So, um, now, of course, we have um, historic legislation, um, AB 2140, the Orca Welfare and Safety Act, which I, which I co sponsored with Carol Ray, Sam Berg, uh, um, and then myself, Ma Dr. Naomi Rose, and Dr. Uh, Deborah Giles, who testified in Sacramento. Um, myself, Carol, and, and Sam, we all three gave our contributing, we all collaborated together and gave our official statement. Um, as much as people would like people to believe that that didn't succeed or it's dead, it's very much alive. It's just an interim study because it overwhelmed the lawmakers because it was such a wealth of information. This is such a secretive world. So it's an interim study. There's no doubt in my mind it's going to pass. And uh, what happened just recently in Washington, and Carol testified in Washington, I believe that, um, that you know, it's going to pass here first. So you guys deserve, I think, to be the forefront on this. So, uh, and, and then, you know, once it passes here, it's gonna pass in California. And then I also helped uh, uh, Republican uh, Senator Greg Ball up in New York for he, he cut, it's basically the same legislation. It's, it's dubbed the Blackfish Bill. It's worded a little bit differently, but it's essentially, it's, it's the same type of legislation that says you can never have killer whales in captivity in our state. You cannot breed captive, uh, captive whales. You cannot artificially inseminate. You cannot transport across uh, state lines, and you cannot transport genetic material. When these laws pass, it's going to cut SeaWorld off at the knees, and they know it. And that's why they're scared. Of it. So the writing is on the wall, and um, you know. There's a huge power shift that is happening. All you guys know it, and I can feel it in this room. There's a huge power shift uh, since Blackfish. And not to say that Blackfish started this fight. I mean, so many, many of you in this room were fighting this battle while I was still enjoying riding on whales, thinking I was the king of the world and had the best job in the world, and, and you know, and, and living in my selfish dream. Although I did love those whales, but. You know, but it did not have the outlet to connect and you know with the right people at the right time to really make it mainstream consciousness. 
and Blackfish did that and mobilized people who already care about this issue, who are already fighting with this issue, and then we gained all these millions more people. So now the power shifted. They don't have the power anymore. We have the power, and that's another reason why they're scared to death. So they threatened to sue me over the book. They started threatening to sue me in November, which was I knew was coming. Um, so that was fun to get that little letter. Um, and um, you know, of course, I had the, the attorneys at Macmillan, and Macmillan is a powerhouse publishing company. But I knew I needed extra protection, so I sought out a very prominent legal firm that uh, I'm incredibly grateful, uh, Hoggins Berman, that took took my case and um, had offered me just, I mean, they've been incredible with me from the beginning, to, to make sure that my rights are protected, that as an American and my First Amendment rights to free speech, I have the right to speak about my life and my experiences. So um, I feel very confident with the people that I have behind me, making sure that I'm protected. So SeaWorld threatened to sue, and they even uh, threatened to file an injunction to try to stop the book. So clearly there's stuff in this book they really don't want people to see. <laughs> and, um, and there's so much more. There's so much more. There was so much more to Blackfish. There's so much more to my book. There's only so much that you can fit in here. But what I tried to do with this book, which set out, which is like, look, I'm just going to give people an accurate like snapshot of my 14 years, all the high points and all the low points. And that says it all. It speaks for itself. I didn't go into it with, I'm going to do this tell-all. But there were so many low points, it just naturally became a tell-all book. And I would find myself still almost programmed to see what way, like, oh, I can't say that because that's damaging. It's like, why am I still feeling like I have to protect these people? Like, no, this is the truth. This is what happened. So, you know, anything now that SeaWorld tries to come out, oh, I pulled it, I even wrote it on this card because I want to get this right in mind. So, when I, this was uh, in February 26th, I did this interview on Bloomberg. And um, first they were supposed to come on and debate with me, and they pulled out of it last second. And then they waited, it was a live interview, and they waited until the interview was over and submitted at the very end this, again, their infamous carefully worded prepared statements. And it said, despite these false claims by John Hartgrove and other extreme animal rights activists, <laughs> part about it is, is that they created me. I am their creation. <laughs> I'm not some person that just studied them in the wild, which, and, and then they can try to say, look, they're just crazy, because that's what we were taught in growing and, and coming up through the racist system, was to completely ignore any researchers in the wild, because they were crazy that we were the leaders in the world. This whole elitist mentality. We are the only ones that know how to work with killer whales. We are the only ones that know how to properly take, take care of killer whales. And I believed it. I believed it for, for years. Took everything out of their mouth as the gospel and defended it. And, um, and you know, and, but now, that because of everything that I know and I'm speaking the truth, now I'm no longer that person. I am an a, a extreme animal rights activist. <laughs> I just also want to, you know, also be honest too. This has been a journey for me because when I first spoke out in Blackfish, um, I was I still, you know, I had the interview for Blackfish just seven days after I resigned from SeaWorld. And it was, all I could see was my experiences and what I could say and what um, I could contribute and what I knew. And I didn't know anything about wild whales. I didn't know anything about the awareness that Jeff and John, Carol, Sam, Dean, all these guys, Naomi Rose, Howard Garrett, all these people were already putting out there. Totally naive to it. So if you notice, even in our um, our um, promotion, all, we did, gosh, we did so many film festivals for Blackfish, um, in our Q&A, when sea sanctuaries would come up, I was silent. I was silent for a reason, 
because at that point, I still wasn't sold on sea sanctuaries. I was still being deprogrammed. I really was being deprogrammed. Um, I wasn't saying I was against it. I was just like, I don't know if that's the right answer. I, what I knew was the right answer was that they had, they had to stop the breeding program. This had to be the last generation of killer whales. But I wasn't yet ready in my mind to say that these that a sea sanctuary oak or sea pen, whatever you want to call it, um, was viable. And that was because of my years of programming at SeaWorld. But by the time we testified in Sacramento for the, for the California State Assembly, at that point, I had met enough people, the right minds, brilliant minds, and knew that it was absolutely possible and viable. So that was a growth process, one of many. And also in the California State Assembly, I remember, you know, because this has been a humbling experience for me because, you know, I feel like, you know, it's easy for me to speak about um, these stories because I had that life. I had that dream as a child. I achieved it. I, I have the most amazing memories with those whales that I'll cherish for the rest of my life. Um, and, you know, I had those experiences and I love those animals. So it makes it easy for me to speak and speak about it passionately. But when I saw at Sacramento, when they, after we had just testified and they let hundreds of people flood through and come in just to spend 10 seconds at the microphone to say whether they supported the bill or not. And these were all people who supported the bill for it to pass. And they would travel from all over California all over the United States and even from other countries for 10 seconds to have a voice because that's how much they cared about this issue. I remember sitting in that chair and go, my God, I made the right decision. I made the right decision to speak out because look at what these people are doing and they did not have that life. They did not have those experiences and look what they're still able to do, willing to do, willing to do. And so, you know, it's been a humbling experience for me because I was not the most humble person coming out of SeaWorld, and I have to own that. And because that's the way we're trained. We were trained that we were the kings of the world, that we were the best in the world, and no, no one was better than us. So, and now I realize there's so much that I have, have to learn. I had, to, I had to ask Carl something. I'm not going to tell you what it is because I'm embarrassed. But I had to text Carol something today. I was like, I was going and interviewed, and I texted her real quick, and I was like, is that this or that? And she just gave me the answer to it. So, uh, but, you know, but, you know, and I, I realized, too, that these people that I had been trained my whole life to think that were crazy, not only did they welcome me so immediately, like a family, but they weren't crazy after all, and they actually were pretty damn smart. <laughs> so I think that we at SeaWorld were actually the crazy ones. So uh, anyway, that's it. So let's go to the next.